Freudism with the psychohistorical movement. Uh, for quite a while, I've been researching materials and writing the book Pioneers of Insight, the Makers and Making of, of Psychohistory. Michael Clifford's very interesting presentation on January 31st of this year to the Psychohistory Forum on Freud's style of leadership set me thinking of a comparison of aspects of the early Freudian and contemporary psychohistorical movements. It is fruitful to compare and contrast these related yet very different and, uh, ideas, um, you know, the movements, in terms of acceptance, creativity, followership, leadership, openness to divergent ideas, splitting, and other issues. I'll start with a brief description of each. Sigmund Freud was such an original thinker that people were drawn to him. He was a healer and creator of a new way of viewing individuals and society. His success resulted in the development of the international movement, which put pressure on him to react differently than as a healer intellectual, and brought out the more rigid side of his personality. Early biographers, such as Ernest Jones, depicted Freud as a heroic figure, struggling against intense criticism and op uh, opposition. Most Freudian clinicians have followed in, in their appreciative footsteps, based mostly on their idealized transference to the originator of their field. Uh, in contrast, Paul Rosen, Michael Clifford, uh, and others, um, both within and outside the psychoanalytic movement, have written at length about Freud's limitations as a leader. Perhaps part of the unconscious, some of the unconscious motivation for this focus <coughs> on Freud's leadership shortcomings is the process of de-idealization of the good father, thus demonstrating one's independence from, or even hostility to, to uh, Freud. How the early history of Freudism relates to organized psychohistory is my primary concern. Clearly, there are many diff differences uh, along with similarities. Leadership in the psychohistory movement was never as focused on one individual as in Freudism. Psychohistory is a movement which gradually came together over a period of time before becoming an organized entity in the 1970s. While rudimentary psychohistorical literature appears early in the 20th century, a coherent, cohesive, and significant movement developed only in the 1950s and 60s in the face of ex extremely valuable work of colleagues such as Dodds, Erickson, Brown, the Georges, and Robert J. Lifton. Uh, can I keep? Expecting you to give me a, a, a time signal. And I've got the whole session here. Uh, psychohistory became a strong current in the 1970s, showing signs of acceptance by mainstream publications, although there were very, always very active naysayers. The prestigious American Historical Review, AHR, under the editorship of Robert Webb, uh, and lesser extent, Otto Flanza, um, this is in the, from 68 to 85, published some explicitly psychohistorical uh, and psychoanalytic articles, including two by Peter Lowenberg in 71 on Himmler and the Nazi uh, youth cohort. The 1970s was alive with interest in and struggles as to institutionalize this new psychohistorical knowledge in the face of a growing resistance to it. In this period, Lloyd de Moss was working very hard to get psychoanalysts to focus on the history of childhood and beginning the process of building institu institutions through the history of childhood quarterly, colon, the Journal of Psychohistory, which uh, after a few years, and tomorrow uh, David Spelling will give you a lot of details on three major journals. Um, uh, it, it become, you know, the Journal of Psychohistory and uh, 
the childhood gets left behind, which, but it was always very hard to do good childhood research. Uh -huh. A week after I attended the first international, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I lost my place. Uh, he created uh, the Institute for Psychohistory, the Psychohistory Press, the National Psychohistorical Association at the first president, um, and the Journal of Psychoanalytic Anthropology. And then a week after I attended the first international psychohistorical association meetings in the spring of 1978, and I'm unfortunately now the only one who's been able to attend all 38 of them, mm. the International Society for Political Psychology, the ISPP, also had its inaugural mm. meeting in Manhattan, which I briefly attended. It, the ISPP, created its own journal, Political Psychology, Unlike the IPA, which has a newsletter, but never had a formal re relationship with the Journal of Psychohistory. The, back to Freud, the psych psychiatric institutions of Vienna and Europe were not eager to welcome Freud and his followers into their fold. Mm -hmm. So the Freudians developed their own institutions, such as the International Psychoanalytic Association, various journals, and a wide variety of training institutes. In my lifetime, a central issue has been the relationship of psychohistory to the existing disciplines. Academic psychology, but not clinicians, overwhelmingly slammed the doors on those who were open to this new methodology. History departments were more ambivalent in their response. In 1956, they had been cool to the American Histori uh, Historical Association's inaugural presidential address of William L. Langer of Harvard, who called for the application of psychoanalysis to history as the next assignment for young historians. However, some of the younger historians began to consider this approach. Darn it, I like that. <laughs> uh, however, in the 1970s, most PhD historians interested uh, in the field were also very anxious and nervous to declare themselves to be practitioners of psychohistory. Most members of the American Historical Association, the AHA's Group for the Use of Psychology in History, GOOF, that's an <laughs> unfortunate acronym, <laughs> GUPH. Uh, were excited by their new methodology, but quite concerned about the reactions of the elders of history, and uncertain about the relationship, their relationship to the psychoanalytic clinicians they were reading and meeting. Their ambivalence was heightened by Eric Erickson's not being comfortable with the term psychohistorian, and lifted changing the name of the Wealthy group for the study of psychohistorical process, which he and others created in 1966, to simply Wealthly. This oldest psychohistorical group still meets annually in the fall. It's an invitation-only seminar, and I'm hoping Winston will live forever and continue that. Um, Charles B. Strozier, who was one of the key members of GOOF, editor of the Psychoist Review, and the only person I, I know of personally who hired with an appointment specifically in Psychoist history, insisted that one could not function properly as a historian if you trained as a psychoanalyst. That sort of left me out. I trained. This opinion was formed uh, by the Chicago Training Institute he attended allowing historians to attend classes, but never see patients and never become a psychoanalyst. However, after Strozier moved to New York uh, to a position established for him by Lifton, he rapidly concluded his training, opened the private practice, and became very active in the psychoanalytic community. <clears throat> Lloyd de Moss had the mentality of the businessmen um, when it came to developing the field of psychohistory in that he did not usually take rejection personally, but continued to invite people to write articles, 
serve on the editorial, editorial board of the journal, and uh, publish their work through his press. The subsequent uh, journal editor that stayed by Zell reported that Lloyd said in the 1980s it had 8,000 subscribers, making it uh, the only profitable psychohistorical publication, and really one of the uh, most read scholarly publications, you know, typical uh, academic journals, you know, have really very few, uh, you know, paid subscribers. The psych political psychology, the journal of the ISPP, came to exist in 79 and continues to thrive, which it's not, you know, as with, you sign up for, to join the organization, you get the journal automatically. Uh, the site History Review, which had an impressive group of academics on the editorial board, uh, had built a subscription base to about 500 through word of mouth and colleagues uh, requesting their library subscribe to it at a time when librarians were at, would actually add subscriptions. Those days are almost entirely past. Uh, the uh, regrettably, Strozier decided to terminate publication of the Psychiatry Review in 1999 because he uh, and the then editor were, to quote him, tired of it, and more fundamentally, they thought, again to quote, that psychohistory was never going to be recognized within the discipline of history as more than ephemeral, with very few people having appointments in the field, end quote. Goof also ceased to meet uh, at approximately the same time. Uh, I found that extremely regrettable since uh, the Psychohistory Review is a very valuable journal. Um, even when there was an enthusiastic of a small group of supporters for psychohistory among academics, no one in psychohistory had anything like the authority of Sigmund Freud in the psychoanalytic movement. This helps to explain why the rivalries within it did not result in institutional splits uh, and, you know, or, or dissidents starting their own groups. The founder of psychoanalysis could split up with an ostracized Adler, Jung, Bronx, Silbener, Steckel, and others. In contrast, Lifton and Strozier might badmouth uh, the Moss and Van McVulcan and those associated with the Institute for Psychohistory, the Journal of Psychohistory, and the IPA, but their control was very limited. Lloyd de Moss, uh, the most controversial leader of psychohistory, did not exclude colleagues. However, he some, sometimes uh, offended colleagues by his editorial judgment leading with theory, organizational decisions, and the extremity of his theories, such as fantasy analysis, the fetal origins of history, poisonous mothers, poisonous placentas, psychogenic theory, and so forth. Uh, and sort of not simply the theories, but he got into uh, a lockstep application of theories, uh, which would, would be offensive to many people. Uh, so the ideas were extremely provocative and valuable in many cases. In fairness to Lloyd, he did not react negatively when colleagues set up new organizations such as the Psychohistory Forum, which is my group, the Group for the Psychohistorical Study of Film, and Cleo Psyche as a new publication. On the other hand, the Moss, uh, you know, had a sense of us who have the truth of scientific psychohistory and the courage to pursue it versus those lacking in these attributes. <laughs> a lot of us and them going on. <clears throat> While both psychoanalysis and psychohistory are intellectual disciplines, they differ in very important respects. Psychohistory lacks the healing power of psychoanalysis. Though personally, I've known many as a psychohistorical organizer for uh, a heck of a long time. I know many people who come to psychohistory looking for some 
therapy of, or the step towards getting some therapy as one of the motivations. Uh, quite importantly, the discipline created by Freud provided a way of making a living since so many of its adherents became therapists. But psychohistory never provided an economic base. Uh, this diminished the cohesion of the field and caused some to become disillusioned with it. Furthermore, despite Freud's exaggeration of the enemies he faced, psychoanalysis was much more favorably received than psychohistory, which, had all, which has always had mixed reviews. Norman Keel, in 1988, published Freud Without Hin Hindsight, Reviews of His Work, 1893-1939, revealing a far more positive reaction than one would gather from Freud's letters um, the, and the early biographies of Jones and others, and those who were close to Freud, who saw themselves as very much the embattled um, you know, true believers. Neither Freud nor the other early analysts and advocates of analysis were psychoanalyzed. Steckel was the first with eight sessions um, uh, to be psychoanalyzed. Um, while many drawn to psychohistory um, were analyzed, um, and, uh, and uh, some were very well-trained analysts, and are. Lloyd de Moss, uh, the Moss's expectation that establishing group process sessions at the end of, of each uh, Institute for Psychohistory and IPA, IPA meeting would prevent the acting out of destructive unconscious emotions did not work as planned. <laughs> as I think back on it, and I was one of the strongest advocates for 15 years. It was at times quite damaging to the unity of the group. Difficulties with the group process analysis centered on the unevenness of the quality of group process analysts, the fact that, uh, that some participants came to these sessions with little or no therapeutic experience and a minimal emotional awareness to say nothing of uh, that some would just want to continue discussion of the last session uh, and have it purely intellectual and don't understand what's this crazy business. You know, we expect to talk about feelings and unconscious stuff. So it's always been a mixed bag, but though, you know, how, last year Howard Stein did a marvelous job uh, uh, and, you know, uh, others did wonderful jobs. Henry did pretty well. Uh, even period before he had any therapy himself, uh, Henry Lawton, that is. Well, uh, there is certainly acting out among his colleagues and acolytes, Freud's enormous emotional and intellectual authority as the founder of psychoanalysis kept much of this acting out in check. Um, so they did better than psychohistory um, with uh, some of these issues. Plus, it was another time frame. The leader, just generally, was much more the authority. Oh, uh, for those old days. Oh, no, no. <laughs> um, to continue with comparisons, psychoanalysis was started by a Jew, and Freud's early followers were overwhelmingly Jewish. While psychohistory has always had a greater mixture of Jews, you know, Peter Gay, Robert J. Lifton, Peter Lowenberg, and Gentiles, such as Lloyd de Moss and uh, William Langer and, uh, and Strozier and Vulcan, among advocates, leaders, and prominent practitioners. If we compare Freud with de Moss, we find that both have a sense of specialness as young children. Amelia Freud called her son, my golden Ziggy. And de Moss uh, spoke uh, of having been the youngest child uh, to read, uh, the, the earliest reader, uh, according to Ripley's Believe It or Not. Clearly, both had major issues with their fathers. Both saw themselves as scientific, yet 
each had strong speculative inclinations. Although throughout most of his career, Freud did a better job than the moths in controlling those impulses. Have a seat up here. You can answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> You're good at that, Irene. Freud's pessimism, strengthened by World War I and the rise of totalitarian communism and fascism, led him to develop the idea of the death instinct, while the moss's optimism led him to develop the concept of helping mode parenting, resulting in children who are, quote, gentle, sincere, never depressed, strong-willed, and all sorts of other good things, end quote. Well, the good things of me, not Freud. <laughs> Uh, both leaders inclined to have favorites, you know, such as Adler and Jung for the Austrian, Henry Ebel and Caspar Schmidt for the American. With great insight, the founder of psychoanalysis recognized that my emotional life has always insisted that I have an, uh, an intimate friend and a hated enemy, end quote. Sometimes they became the same. Uh, such splitting was not unknown to the American who spoke about splits being normal among groups. Freud, born in the Victorian era, could be tyrannical at times in dealing with his followers, while the Moss could make very abrupt changes uh, as a leader, uh, which alienated some of his followers, uh, his colleagues, uh, uh, and he always spoke of being uh, collegial, though he would get into one of the acolytes as well. Lloyd de, Mo uh, Lloyd de Moss sometimes saw himself as the Freud of psychohistory. Um, in choosing de Moss, and I, I'm looking out at some faces, is that a disagreement <laughs> by, by colleagues who've been here as forever as I have? But we'll find out later in questions and answers. In choosing the Moss for this comparison with Freud, I do not mean to argue that he was the leader of psychohistory, just the one who was organizationally and theoretically most prominent and who I know the most about, and especially in this group, which um, he was the founding father of uh, and first president of. Uh, it makes sense to talk about him. Other psychohistorical leaders to bear in mind are Lifton, Vulcan, Lowenberg, Robert J. Lifton, much better known and much more accepted in the intellectual community generally. Uh, but he didn't involve himself in psychohistorical uh, organizations beyond Wellfleet. Uh, Vulcan created a center and a journal and did such yeoman service for peace that he has been nominated repeatedly for Nobel Peace Prize. Peter Lowenberg uh, was the key person creating the university. California Consortium, and much more. Okay, it should also be kept in mind that though the focus of this study is on primarily uh, for psychohistory, the academic history, psychohistory has a fair number, often a large number of supporters uh, coming from anthropology, uh, clinical work, literature, and many people in literature who are uh, in academia. Political science, uh, the same comment for them, sociology, and elsewhere. Neither movement was able to ensconce itself with the academic departments in the USA, although in Vienna in 2005, there was a Sigmund Freud University teaching psychotherapy. Despite this academic resistance, both have had a profound, profound impact on our thinking and offer great insights into the individual and society. As I have said uh, on other occasions, I will close this presentation with the words of Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and popular historian Barbara Tuckman. Every thoughtful historian is a psycho historian. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Clark. Uh, one of the things I think about psychoanalysis is when you're trained, part of the training is you're having your own analysis and taking a look at how it is that you decided to be an analyst in the first place. Mm -hmm. okay? And the book on Faces in the Cloud, which is Atwood's book, talks about how it is that Freud and Jung and uh, who the others are 
what, what those influences might have been that persuaded them to be a Tuskegee analyst in the first place. So uh, that, that I wonder if there are anybody who's done a lot of work with the historians as to how come the mindset is, is so uh, adamant about uh, not, not uh, being involved with psychohistory. Um, there was an article, which I think was a, is in the Sunday Review of the Times a while back, uh, there was more discussion of Freud in the history departments than there was in the psychology department. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. psychology is out. slammed yeah. the doors, but of yeah. course, clinicians, yeah. and I look, look around the room at some of them, uh, yeah. you know, say, hey, this, this makes for a, uh, you know, for better treatment, a better job. Uh, if nothing else, I think when uh, Bert Seitler and I were practicing in a group in Oakland, New Jersey together, uh, the two analysts in the group said, you notice how we have full practices uh, and these other guys, the behaviorist and whatever the fourth guy was, uh, uh, they, their patients don't uh, stay with them because they don't get enough benefit. Um, the uh, yes. okay, and uh, you know, Dave Brazel yesterday uh, covered a lot on uh, answer to uh, your question, and uh, so we'll see. You know, maybe some of that will get printed. Other questions, Dennis, you know, to support your decision to uh, compare Freud and, and DeMoss. In, yes, in the uh, <laughs> survey I had done, one of the questions was um, regarding which theorists were, were most influential. Mm -hmm. And of course, the top theorist was was Freud, but DeMoss uh, had the same number Good. Uh, mm -hmm. in the group that was still both of them. Yeah. Uh, how large was your? <laughs> yeah. yeah. We'll talk about it later. Yeah. Our yeah. family is mild. I'll take it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have but, um, you, you have the but problem. It's interesting to see that they that, yeah. that in this sample. Anyway. No, yeah, yeah. And we're dealing with small samples. Yes. When I, I thought Lloyd DeMoss had a brilliant idea with fantasy analysis, yes. uh, and got uh, formed a, a group with a psychiatrist uh, who subsequently ran off to Vermont and Henry Lawton, where we met every I don't know uh, every other week or something for six months, and. We studied uh, fantasy analysis uh, using materials, and uh, and Lloyd insisted that our our conclusions were oh, this is definite proof positive. <laughs> to me, uh, one of the problems was we were stuck with a fairly small group, yeah. people who were willing to to go ahead and. Uh, try this material. We sent out a couple of document, documents. Uh, uh, one was Declaration, from Declaration of Independence, the other was Reagan's Star Wars speech. Of course, both were identifiable uh, to see how people would respond to them. Uh, Io was said, we, th this is great stuff, but it was like we're trying to do brain surgery, but we still only have meat cleavers at this point. Uh, and it was so easy to get involved, you know, proving your own theories, which I've never been that good at. I slip into it occasionally. Dave? Just the point of information, there was an article published in the Journal of Psychohistory on the basis of that work. So there's something out there, it's in one of the issues. Oh, you know, in about the 1980s, 1980s that it was published and yeah. always cited as yeah, too positive. Uh, of stuff which I would wince at because uh, I didn't say that. I, I didn't say this proof positive, just uh, it's an indication that there's value here. I put in for a grant, I got some terrific people who were well trained in uh, probing unconscious who were not related to psychohistory uh, and put in for a grant uh, to the, the and a, uh, National Endowment for Humanities mm -hmm. to do a serious study mm -hmm. on the subject. Of course, uh, it was turned down, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and I wondered why I spent all that time uh, doing this fancy grants. I've, mm -hmm. I've long discovered it doesn't pay to mm -hmm. apply for grants. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Paul, 
Um, I was wondering a little bit about the comparison of contexts and wondered what your thoughts were on the development of psychoanalysis and the rise of um, Nazism and then the 1970s that, that Dave was talking about and what kind of period that was here with Reagan. And also the other interesting part um, for me is, is uh, um, the idea of narcissism within psychoanalysis was becoming developed by Kohut on the one hand and Kernberg on the other in the 70s. So I'm just wondering about the comparison of the two contexts, historical contexts, that gave rise on the one hand to psychoanalysis and other to psychohistory. Yeah. Well, I have a lot of responses uh, to your question, if I can remember uh, the details of both the question and the responses. Uh, psychoanalysis did well in the United States and, of course, was killed off uh, in, in Austria and uh, and Germany pretty nearly, though it's revived to some extent. Psychohistory outside of the United States, uh, uh, as Peter can attest from having gone to a better, uh, uh, a better attended psychohistory conference just that April 17th through 19th in Europe, uh, if, that the uh, psychohistory is, is strong in Europe, though they always look to us, maybe because we have the title of international. Uh, in our name. Um, narcissism, well, there's so much narcissism, uh, and of course Reagan's period was uh, not encouraging, but I'm reminded of uh, Lloyd and Casper Schmidt being invited to the White House uh, under Reagan uh, to give a Saturday presentation, and uh, when, uh, as to this is how you can gauge what's happening with the public opinion motion. When it was all done, uh, Lloyd or Casper uh, wouldn't uh, ask, well, what do you guys think to the White House aides? So, well, you know, we listened to everyone. Just last week, we had an astrologer in here. We know they listened to the astrologer. No sign that they listened at all. Well, that just means I have a lot of uh, psycho historians who are astrologers. Uh, I've only run into one at these meetings. Uh, though some may do it, of course. You know, more Americans tend to believe in astrology than in science, but either here. They, okay, uh, yes. John? Um, with regard to establishing psychohistory, do you know of any history departments who have advertised and tried to hire someone who is a psychohistorian? Well, it was, uh, Chuck Strozier was hired as such from the information I asked, and he gave me the name of the president but of the then college, Bezell, spelled somewhat differently than your name, Dave, uh, uh, as to what the situation was. I think there was confusion with Asimovian psychohistory. But anyway, Chuck got hired uh, and ran with it. Uh, and uh, and uh, that was uh, certainly a good thing, uh, even if he's, he downplays psychohistory at this point. Um, so when psychoanalysis started... Oh, I should just say, okay. uh, I changed the title. Uh, I had my title changed, even though I knew it would cost me uh, politically at my college, so that it is of history, uh, psychohistory, and into the disciplinary studies. And I did that both out of identification with psychohistory, and I was warned by a colleague uh, who used to roll his eyes at the were in psychohistory, and then came to be very appreciative of the work I did, uh, who was then, you know, acting provost of our, our institution, uh, because interdisciplinarity was diminishing, uh -huh. and I was having less and less room in which I could, I could do uh, avert psychohistorical teaching. Uh, but uh, for me, the value of psychohistory is uh, so worthwhile that I'm willing to pay the, the price. And, uh, sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. Oh. I'll say something else. Can, can you cut me off again in the middle? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll cut you off now. <laughs> <laughs> now we'll save the middle. Okay. 
So when, when psychoanalysis started at the Wednesday meetings at Freud's house, anybody who wanted to come came and they were part of it. As time went on to become a psychoanalyst, you needed the training and analysis. And then later on, that you needed to be through some sort of institute or to be institutionalized. <laughs> Don't let the world know. Um, has there been anything comparable in terms of training institutes for psychohistorians? Uh, there are attempts. Uh, George Trend and uh, Rappaport, uh, who wrote varieties of psychohistory historian and uh, uh, academic psychologist, uh, tried to set one up at the University of Kansas in, in Manhattan, which they always insisted. Uh, this is the other Manhattan, uh, the one in New York. Um, there is a Manhattan, Kansas. Uh, didn't go too far. Um, when was it? How long did it last? Dave, you remember how long? A couple of years, and it was Kansas State. Kansas State. Yeah, oh, I said University of Kansas. Thanks for the correction. The uh, Peter Lowenberg, who was a very young man, uh, identified with psychoanalysis and psychohistory, and who got those two AHR articles published in '71, uh, set up a program he, in the history department. Uh, so that the his at UCLA, student, at UCLA uh, his students uh, could, if they chose, and he encouraged it, go to the uh, training institute and uh, get some significant training. Now, uh, ultimately he retired, um, and then he was called back because they needed him for some of his skills. But one of the problems was mo some of the students weren't able to get academic jobs. Uh, some became full-time therapists, um, uh, one of whom will probably do a, a featured scholar art, uh, on, uh, article on. Um, they One went into business using the skills he had learned. So were these graduate students of his in history at UCLA yes. who then got training at the Psychoanalytic Institute? Yeah. And was, they continued it, and so the, was the was the, it, the was the training in the Psychoanalytic Institute also in psychohistory or more in psychoanalysis? It was in psychoanalysis. Okay. So it was a combination okay. uh, of the uh, programs, uh, and, and there were certain patterns. People would take courses with Rudy Binion at Brandeis, uh, and then he'd refer them to Peter Lowenberg, even though there was no warm feelings between the two. Um, and because that's where you could, you could get proper training. Uh, there were, when Lee Snydman here in the city, uh, who was a, uh, a uh, early modern, late medieval, early modern historian, uh, wanted to know more. His wife, Connie, was a uh, psychoanalyst. Uh, he went to one place in the city where you they wouldn't let him see patients. Fine by him because he said all my patients were dead uh, in terms of his subject matter. Best patients. Uh, uh, I knew we'd get your humor in here. Bert. And then he went to the next place and he had to drop out of that because they were insisting that he see patients. Uh, you know, when I went into training, uh, there was a lit person. We had a class of, was it six or seven? A uh, lit person, uh, also a college professor, who was in training uh, with me as a historian so, and mostly nurses so, uh, and what I was asking social workers. Was say you're talking about people are trained in history and then getting trained in psychoanalysis, and except for the Kansas State one, you haven't mentioned specific training in at the graduate level in psychohistory. Mm -hmm. uh, that was not. That was the only attempt which. That I know it didn't go far. Yeah, Peter, Peter Lohenberg, there are four fields you offer in, as a graduate student for your PhD in history, and at UCLA they could opt for psychohistory. 
Uh, that's the only university I know of where that was the case in the entire country. Although people who have gone on to get their PhDs from history departments and done psychohistorical work have done it because they were working with a mentor who was enthusiastic or allowed them to do that. I'm thinking of Ken, Ken Melkalfas here at mm -hmm. NYU uh, and uh, Tom Cohut at the University of Minnesota. Oh. Yes, uh, uh, that is a unique made it possible. And now, some people like Lloyd DeMoss was in political science and he, he wanted explicitly to be able to write a, uh, a psychohistorical uh, uh, dissertation and um, most people, especially at Columbia, who wanted to do that, you found someone who was open to it. Uh, sometimes because that was their own research, sometimes because they just, okay, we, we tolerate this, we've read some good stuff along these lines. It's not our, our bag, but we can, we can uh, allow you to do it. Uh, but uh, for him, it wasn't, it wasn't acceptable. He, he, Lloyd was a crusader for, for psychohistory. Paul well, uh, Dave, do you know if, if at UCLA you can still do psychohistory? Is that? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, I don't think so because Peter retired again. And Peter is busily working with uh, getting psychotherapy to China. They don't dare do psycho. Uh, political psychobiography of the type that I do and Dave has done and so forth, of course, but uh, training a lot of uh, psychotherapists in China to where they're treated as rock stars, uh, according to uh, at least one of the people involved in that. Okay, Jack. Yes, I'm very pleased that the IPA is still going strong after all we have many presenters here and uh, about 50 for the next few days, over 50 and we have many members. But again, with regard to what you were saying, the, the problem is establishing psychohistory. Now, I recall uh, several years ago at the, one of our psychohistory forums, Dave Beisel here said that in his school, he was called psycho out loud. <laughs> Derisively, of course. And he, he confronted it and right. got the... He wrote a letter to this person, right. But uh, imagine and got the this person to back psycho. off. Uh, also, pardon? I said, imagine, I mean, the opposition and the hostility to the, to the field. Mostly it's been, mostly it's been quiet uh, opposition and, uh, uh, and you're not in the room when they shoot down your attempts at getting promoted or getting this or that. Uh, and, uh, but uh, it's there. It's not Dave Mizell so also, when they were detenuring people, uh, was because he could attract all those students and show all those publications while so many of his colleagues were doing nothing uh, in scholarship. Uh, he, that helped him to uh, keep from being detenured. Though he, he doesn't lead with that. Dave, I'm always more positive. Dave's more negative because he wants <laughs> the fathers of psycho, uh, of history to accept our field. I've, Screw them, I say. <laughs> and I say, I'm not going to waste my energy on people who won't do it. And I recognize that when they need, they're doing certain types of work, they come and use our work, the work of uh, a psychoanalyst and other clinicians, because they need these tools to do a good job. Uh, and since their colleagues tend to Bad mouth the field, they usually it's don't not so subtle. give credit. You know, as you suggested, it's just as, as subtle. Uh, as I quoted the American Historical Review yesterday, and the American Historical Perspectives, I quoted yesterday, just a couple of months ago, they've been denouncing the field, and psychohistory has been removed from the taxonomy. Shh. So I complained about that, by the way, some years ago. Yeah, I know you did. I did too, and they promised to restore it. Yes, and yes. they never have. Whereas the ISPP recognizes psychohistory, as, yes. as you know, yes. and we will present it at the ISPP right, right. over the years right. several times. We're going to do it anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to do it well. So, <laughs> and 
I thank you for your good <laughs> question and attendance. Thank you.